right, if you got your Bibles, turn to Romans 8. We'll preach again from Romans 8. I was in Romans 8 last week. And we looked at verses 1 through 6 last week, and those verses are about walking according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. That it's a spiritual mindset. We've got to get our mind right uh, to walk according to the Spirit. When our mind is right, when we have the mindset of the Spirit, that's what helps us to walk according to the Spirit. Uh, So this week we're going to look at another work of the Spirit in the life of the believer. And that's what Romans 8 is all about. Paul brings in the power source for godly living. He introduces us to the Holy Spirit, who is our power source. The Holy Spirit is the third person, not an it, the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is co-equal with the Father and co-equal to the Son. You know, I, I say that because... I I think a lot of people believe that the Holy Spirit is like a second-class citizen, that he's just the leftovers, that it's all Father and all Son, but but it's three in one. They all all have a role. They're all God. You know, the Holy Spirit is just as much God as Jesus, and just as much as the Father. So that's that's the doctrine of the Trinity. And so in Romans 8, I'm going to start in verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Romans is the manifesto on the gospel. Remember, he's writing to Roman believers. Now, if you noticed here, it says, uh, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Uh, Paul is not suggesting here to the believers that if you walk according to the flesh, all of a sudden God's going to take you and snatch you and throw you into hell. He's... The literal interpretation does not mean that. It, the, the, the translation means you're living like a person on the verge of death. If you're living according to the flesh, you're on the verge of death. In other words, you're not living according to the Spirit. You're living like a dead man walking. Because when you get the Holy Spirit, you come alive. You live like a person alive. So that's what he means here. And verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. Our spirit, that's the heart, the the hidden man of the heart, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, I'm focusing this message on verse 16, which says the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. I'm preaching on the witness of the Spirit. Witness of the Spirit. In every human heart, there's a desire to belong, to be accepted, to be loved. Every human heart has a desire to be welcomed into a family to be in a family a loving family that's the cry of every heart family to be accepted for for families to accept me for for my family to love me you know i was i'm fortunate to be part of to be born physically born into a wonderful family I've got a wonderful mom. I've got a wonderful dad. They have just, just great families. I, I love both sides of my family. My mom's, my mom's side is Pennsylvania Dutch Irish. She, she, she'll beat you up. She will beat you up. She's about that tall, and she will, she'll whoop you. She'll whoop you. Any Pennsylvanians in the house? Let's say anybody in here with, there you go, anybody in here with some Irish in you. I mean, you, you're just looking for a fight. I mean, I'm just, I'm just looking for Pennsylvania Dutch Irish, good cooks, hard workers. Uh, I grew up on rolls and dough and bread and uh, dessert is bread. The, the main course is bread, everything, bread, yeast rolls baked goods, pies like this tall and cakes. My grandmother, she could cook like crazy. Fattening food, you know, lasagnas, just all, all, that, all that stuff. 
We like to laugh. You know, that side of the family, they, they like to laugh. They like to goof off. They're sarcastic. You think they hate you, but really they like you. That's just, the, that's just their nature. You know, it's, it's like either love them or hate them. <laughs> but you know where they stand. They're just, sar- you know, our, our mouths have been known to get us in trouble. You know, that's, that's, that's their side. My dad's side is West Virginia German with the hint of Irish. That's right. My, uh, my grandmother, my dad's mom, was a Flanagan. So I think that's a little Irish, don't you? Got German blood. My grandfather worked the coal mines of West Virginia. They were a working poor family. Uh, raised eight kids. That was in the days of the company store when, when you worked just to buy a little food and to buy, a little, you know, to buy some clothes. And you, you, they gave you these, these tokens or whatever and you cashed them in at the company store. They didn't have, they didn't have Walmarts out in those days. They're, um, they're outdoorsmen. They're hunters. They're hillbillies. They're rednecks. Amen. I, that is an amen. That is an amen. My dad said, if you shake my family tree, you don't know what's going to fall out. You don't know what's going to fall out. If you want to get a mental picture, think Duck Dynasty times like 100 degrees. I mean, these guys, I'm telling you, I guess that's where I, I learned to love the outdoors and love shooting and loved hunting and and fishing. So I got a combination of both sides in me. I've got their DNA. I'm, I'm confirmed as a child in th- through, through my DNA, through, through my blood. I also have confirmation that I'm part of the family because I have a birth certificate that confirms my sonship. There were, there were doctors present when my mom gave birth to me. Now, you know, it's a funny story. My dad wasn't present. I think my mom's still upset at my dad because I'm, she's going to have a C-section and my dad's out getting his driver's license renewed. And I don't know if she's ever <laughs> forgot, forgiven him. He's out getting his driver's license. And she's, she's in there, I mean, you're giving birth. So he wasn't present, but the doctors were present. The nurses were present. My mom was present when I arrived. And my certificate, my birth certificate has the signature, has the witness that I am the son of Chuck and Carol Peters. And that's the kind of the picture that I get here when I read this scripture because in in like manner, Paul is writing in verse 6 that it's the Holy Spirit that, that is the witness of our sonship. He's the testimony The Holy Spirit validates, he confirms with our spirit that we are children of God. You know, 1 John says, Beloved, my little children, I write unto you that you might know that you can have eternal life. See, God is about you knowing that you're his child. Not not walking around in debt wondering, I hope I'm his child. I wonder if, no, you can know. And that's what Paul said. You can know because he's given us the Holy Spirit as a confirmation, as a witness that we are children of God. And, and I just shared that about my family uh, because I'm proud of, of my family. I'm proud of where I came from. But I also am sensitive to the fact that maybe, but maybe there's people listening that don't share the same family dynamics. Maybe you don't have the relationship with, with your father or, or your, your mother. Maybe it's just a, different, just a different scenario. Maybe when you think of family, just even me talking about this, you're clamming up, you're, you're shutting, shutting down. But if anything, I hope you get this. If that's you, I hope you understand that, that as long as you're a Christian, you're in the greatest family of all. As long as you're a Christian, you have the greatest father of all. And, and he's given you the spirit. If you've received this gospel, he's given you the spirit as a witness to testify and confirm your sonship as a child of God. And that's what this message is about. It's about knowing without a doubt that I am a child of God. How does the Spirit bear witness with our spirit? How does the Spirit confirm our sonship? There's three observations here of how the Spirit testifies with our spirit, confirms that we are children of God. Look at 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Number one, the Spirit leads us. 
That's a confirmation that we are children. When I say sons, of course, I mean daughters as well. We're children of God. Now, this verse is often taken out of context where, where people will they'll pluck this verse out of the Scripture. As many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. They'll pull it out and they'll say things like, well, if you're, if you're, not, being, if you're not getting a clear leading of the Spirit, if you're not hearing the voice of the Spirit and hear and do this, do this, then you're, you're really not a child of God. If, if you don't have the actual, if you don't, completely sense the leading of the spirit in every single thing that you do then you're not a child of god that means you're not a child of god see that's what people will say but that's not what paul is saying you always got to keep scriptures in context and you read the surround the way you keep things in context you read the surrounding verses you read the surrounding chapters you read the entire book that's how you can always keep them in their intended place don't you know that we're, we don't make the word of God like how we want it to be? We have to accept it for what it is, how it was written. So in this context, what does this mean? That those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Well, notice the beginning of verse 4, or beginning of verse 14, I'm sorry. It says, for, for as many. For can also be translated because. What Paul is getting at is, is that, that, that for, that because, that's a transition from what was previously said. So you have to go back to what was previously said to understand what he's talking about. So let me read the ch- verses 12 and 13 again. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For or because... As many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Remember the context, it, especially through the, ver- the first 11 verses, is about the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, walking in godliness, walking according to the Spirit, walking a life that, that pleases God. That's, that's the central theme, not according to the flesh. So being led by the Spirit in this context is not a mystical leading. I'm going here. I'm going there. It's a practical leading of the Spirit where the Holy Spirit leads you to godliness, leads you to doing what is right, to living a God-honoring life. The leading he's talking about is the leading of the Spirit that causes us to want to live according to the Spirit that causes us, that leads us to want to walk in holiness. This is the confirmation that he's talking about that confirms we're children of God. To give you an example, as, as a little boy, I learned that my parents' discipline and correction and instruction and, and leading me to do what's right was a confirmation of their love for me. They wanted to train me to grow up, to be a God-honoring man, to be a contributing member to society. And their instruction and their leading confirmed their love in me. It, it confirmed that I was their child. I, I never I say if, when we were out in the stores... And there's a child acting up. I mean, just throwing a tantrum with the, with the mother. I never saw one of my parents walk over to that child and just start spanking that child. I never saw that. Never saw them discipline another child <laughs> because that's not their child. But I, I felt them discipline me. I was going to say I saw them. I felt them discipline me. Because I was their child. I'm going to tell them myself. Hopefully you understand and get the whole story. But I've stolen one time in my life. I was seven years old. And I'm, I don't know. I'm kind of innocent. Because I didn't know. I saw everybody just grabbing stuff. So I figured I'm, I'm here you go. Just grab stuff. And take. So, so anyways, I'm seven years old. I grab some stickers. And I grab a scented marker. At a, in a mall. At a little gift shop in the mall. And so I take these stickers. I'm thinking, oh. I'm, nothing's wrong you know I'm, I'm good 
I'm like, and I put these, these stickers, I get home, I put the stickers on my books, and, and I'm putting them all over. I was a dumb criminal. I was a dumb criminal. <laughs> and I'm taking my marker, and I'm writing over stuff. And, and before too long, maybe a day or so after, my mother realized, something is not right with these stickers. I've never seen these stickers before. I've never seen this marker before. You know, moms just have that gut instinct where they, like, know everything, you know? It's, they're not God, but they're like God, and that they know everything that's going on. Where did you get those stickers? Where, where did you get that marker? Uh, well, well from, from the store? How did you get it? Took it? Took it? So that's, you grab stuff? <laughs> I took, she, so, so she had to tell me, you just stole. You just committed a crime. <laughs> you could go to jail for what you did. You got to pay for this stuff. So, so your little seven-year-old tender heart, I'm, I'm tender hearted and I'm feeling guilty. Oh, I'm a thief. I'm a, you know, I'm, oh, I'm just this terrible person. So you know what she did? She had me gather up those stickers and put them on the thing and, and, and uh, mark them. And she took me down to the mall. And I had to go into that store and that clerk and, and my mom said, tell them what you did. So I'm standing there, I'm crying. I stole the, the, the stickers and, and I stole the, the markers and I'm sorry. And I mean, it was just the end of, it was just the end of the world. And, uh, and what happened is my mom pays for the goods, but she didn't let me have those stickers. Nope, she didn't let me have that marker. She said, you're going to give those to, to one of your friends that don't have much. And so I ended up giving them to a friend. You got to promise you're never going to steal again. <laughs> I mean, you know, that little friend's thinking, man, I, I, I hope he steals some more. I'll give me some free stickers, you know. So they probably, they probably hate to see my life of crime come to an end. But the point is their, their instruction, their leading, they can, that was a, a confirmation of their love for me. That showed that they cared for me. It was a teachable moment for me. It, it, it gives me assurance of my sonship. And in, and in like manner, we have assurance of our sonship spiritually because the Spirit leads us to godliness. If my parents never led me, if they never disciplined me, if they, if, they, if they showed a lack of concern when I'd done wrong, it shows that they think little about me. They think little about me. And if you don't have a desire to want to please God, if you don't have a desire to want to live for God, if you can just live, willfully continue in sin and, and violate the word of God, and if it not bother you, you might need to check your salvation. Because that's a mark and a confirmation of, of sonship is that the spirit will lead me to want to do what's right he'll lead me to want to please God and live for him the spirit convicts you how many of you ever sensed the conviction of the spirit see that's a good sign the spirit convicts you he gives you a desire to want to walk according to the spirit not according to the flesh a Christian that runs from God cannot stay gone long from God you might be it might be a few years you might be a few years but I guarantee you at some point if you're really a child of God right Keith <laughs> if you're really a child of God that spirit he, he, he's got the hook in you and he's going to start drawing you back if he if he lets you go well it means you're not a child of God he convicts you when you, get out of, when you get out of fellowship, you, you get an uneasy feeling in your heart. You're, you're uncomfortable. Spirit makes you uncomfortable when you're doing something that you know is not right. See, that's a confirmation that I'm a child of God. Though. That's not a bad thing. Be glad for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. This is liberating. Oh, thank you for that conviction. It shows that I'm a son, that I'm a child of God. When we sense that conviction, when we sense that leading of the Spirit, what that means is it's time to return. It's time to return to God. 
It's time to return and, and repent and submit and yield to the Spirit of God. Do you know that confession is different than repentance? Just because you, you can confess, you can confess every single sin that you've ever done. That means nothing. What is conf All right, I did it. As if God doesn't know you've done it. <laughs> and by the way, we confess to the Heavenly Father. But, but the, the point is, we confess and we, re we repent. What does repentance mean? To turn. That's why the Spirit convicts. He convicts us to turn us around back to the Father. And that's a confirmation that we are children of God. Another confirmation of our sonship, number two, the Spirit liberates us from fear. So He leads us. He leads us, but He liberates us. He liberates us from fear. Verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of, a bondage, uh, the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, or Papa, Aramaic. That's Aramaic for Papa, Daddy, Father. The bondage to fear that Paul's writing about, if you've read chapter 7, is the fear of judgment. It's the fear of failure. It's the fear of not measuring up to God's standards. Seven is about the law. Fearful that I can't live up and measure up to God's holiness. It, it's the fear that God's going to disown me. It's the fear produced by condemnation according to verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. The Paul is saying here that you're liberated from the spirit of bondage again to fear because the Father has given you the spirit of adoption. He's adopted you as his own child. To the ancient Roman readers, you know the culture was different back in those days. To the ancient Roman readers, they would have understood this word adoption. This was, they would have stopped still if they heard that word. Because adoption had powerful meaning. Adoption in that day was for the rich and for the powerful, for the elite. And right or wrong, and it, this is, doesn't seem right, but when a child was born to biological parents in these days, these ancient Roman days, when a child was born, the biological parents had the option of disowning that child at birth. If it wasn't the right sex that they wanted, if there were deficiencies, if they didn't desire him. You know, in America, we just abort the kids, right? But in this, they killed, or not killed, they disowned. They disowned, you know, which is another reason why we vote pro-life in the election coming up. It was, if, it was, if they didn't want, they disowned. But not for an adoption child adopted child once you're adopted you can never be legally disowned in Rome adopting a child meant that the child was freely chosen and handpicked by the parents therefore the child would forever be a permanent part of the family and in fact the adopted children in Rome they never felt inferior they grew up with a sense of pride. They grew up with a sense of privilege, knowing that I was desired. I was chosen by my parents. I heard the story of, of a first grade class, and, and the teacher asked the students. She was, she was teaching about adoption, and she asked the students, does anybody know about adoption? And one little girl raised her hand, and she said, I know about adoption because I was adopted. She said, my mommy said... It's, it's when I grow in her heart, not in her tummy. <laughs> Isn't that a good example? Grow in my heart, not in my tummy. See, before the world was ever created, we were growing in God's hearts. His heart. Ephesians 1.4, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. You were chosen. You were accepted before time began. Therefore, you can have confidence that you will never be disowned or rejected 
by our Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. Jesus said in John 6, 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. I love that verse. Because you don't have to live in fear wondering if God loves you and accepts you as his child. You don't have to live in fear wondering if you're good enough or measuring up. If you've run to Jesus, if you've received the finished work of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, placed all your trust in Calvary, you are a child of God, signed, sealed, delivered. He will not disown you. He will not. He will not. The adoption process for parents are, are long and grueling. If you've ever went through adoption, I've witnessed it as, as pastor. I've had to give references. It could take years, years, years. I've given character references as a pastor for adoptive parents, and oftentimes it would be, I shouldn't say often, I haven't been many times, but I would give multiple references for one particular case. Because they, I mean, they want to they check and see, are they good parents? What's the conditions of the house? Do you see any red flags? Do you see anything that could be an endangerment for the parent, you know, for the kids? During the adoption process, the adoptive parents are continually having to prove that they're going to make good parents. They have to prove it. <laughs> they're the ones that have to prove it. It's not the child that has to prove his or her worth to be a good child. It's the parents that have to prove their worthiness of being good parents. And ladies and gentlemen, in the family of God, it's not the children of God that have to prove their worth in order for the Father to accept us. It was the Father who demonstrated His love and demonstrated His worth by sending His only begotten Son to the cross of Calvary to be your substitute, to be the forgiveness of sins. He proved Himself. He proved... See, see it was based on the, the worth of Jesus Christ. If, if it was based on our worth... We would never be accepted, would we? It's the worth of Jesus. Our worth as children is found in Christ. Our acceptance is found through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Our adoption is based solely on receiving what Jesus has done for us. He's the worthy one. I just get to reap the benefits. And just sing like that old song. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. That's right. He proved his worth. So we don't have to live in fear and condemnation. We're secure. We're safe. We're protected in the family of God. We call him Abba, Father, Daddy, Papa. Because we have the spirit of adoption to confirm our sonship. Isn't this good news? Oh, this is good news. I, you know, it, it's, it's not your... It, you don't have to try to stay... You're not saved, and, and you don't stay saved. Let me say it like this. You don't stay saved based upon what you do. You stay saved by keep trusting in what Jesus has done. I mean, it's a game changer when we get there. It's a game changer. See, what this does is when... You, when you understand who you are and whose you are, oh, I'm a child of God, a child of the Most High. You walk with your head up. You don't droop around. How are you doing? I'm blessed. My daddy owns it all. I'm secure. I'm not broke. I, I'm blessed with every spiritual blessing in that I am a child of God. How many children of God are in the house today? Come on. I'm secure. See, if, to, if God could disown you, it means the cross was a farce. 
Think about that. If he could disown you after you receiving what Jesus said, it means the cross wasn't sufficient. It means his blood wasn't God's blood. We're secure because of Jesus, because of what Jesus has done. Number three, the Spirit lavishes the Father's inheritance to us. So he leads us, he liberates us, he lavishes the Father's inheritance to us. That's another confirmation, my last point. Another confirmation of our sonship. Verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. See, being adopted in ancient Rome also made the adopted child just as much an heir to the father's possessions as the father's own biological children. He had an equal right. He, she, they didn't come into the family and just dismissed. Or they weren't stuck with the hand-me-downs and the leftovers. Here's your sisters, something she wore and it's too big and they look, you know, all haggard walking around. No. An adopted child had the same share of the father's possession, the same share of the inheritance as his own biological children. They were joint heirs. Think about that. Joint heirs. An equal share to the father's inheritance. We're joint heirs with Christ. We're equal sharers of the Father's inheritance with Christ. Peter says, to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, reserved in heaven for, for, for me. <laughs> We've got an inheritance reserved in heaven for us. Now, I'll be honest, that my, my limited mind, I cannot comprehend what it really means to be a joint heir with Christ I, I just don't have the ability with my mind of old fleshly mind to comprehend what does it mean to be a joint heir with Christ If you don't know what that means either we won't understand it until we get to heaven but what I do understand when it says that we are a joint heir with Christ it means I'm fully vested in the family of God I'm fully vested in the family of God I'm fully desired by God, fully loved, fully accepted, fully blessed, nothing lacking, nothing missing in my life. I've got an, an inheritance reserved in heaven for me. I'm a joint heir with Christ, and you're a joint heir with Christ too. If Jesus is your Savior if you're in the family of God. See, this is confirmation that you're a child of God. Confirmation because the Spirit, He leads us to want to do what's right. He, he, uh, he liberates us from, from fear of, of failure. He confirms our sonship. He lets me know that I'm adopted, I'm chosen, handpicked by God, and He lavishes His inheritance upon me. I don't know how you came in this morning. I, and those watching online, I don't know what's going on in your world. You might have come in burdened down, just, just a, uh, living in condemnation. Maybe you've come in. May, maybe you, you've been running from God. But I know how you can leave today. You can leave with assurance that you are a child. You can leave with assurance, security that you are a child of God. Maybe you're in the family of God. Maybe you've, you've, you see, you've been out here, you've been out in the world, you've been running from, from God, and you've been sensing this uneasiness. Well, that's a, let me tell you, that's a good sign. <laughs> that's a good sign. But you just, uh, maybe this is just a confirmation message that it's just time to let the Spirit just, just pull me back in into the Father's house. The story of the prodigal son. That son took his inheritance. He took off, 
He blew it all, said, I don't need to be in the Father's house. He went out. He was wallowing around with the pig pens, lost everything. But see, the good point of God's, God's grace is you can't outrun God's grace. No matter how far you try to run, His grace is still farther. It's farther. But that father was, was waiting and waiting and waiting for that child to come back. But, but it says that when, that when he came to the end of himself, you know what that means? It means, oh, I, that, that sonship kicked in. That spirit was pulling him back. See, that's a good sign, right? That spirit, and, and it said that every day the father was waiting for the son to return. Every day the waiting for, and finally the day came when the son went back home. And, and what's so awesome about this story is it said that as soon as the father saw the son, the father went running to the son. It wasn't the son who came running to the father. It was the father who came running to the son to welcome him, to celebrate, throw a party. He gave him a robe. He gave him a ring, signifying the blessing and favors in the father's house. Psalms 91, in the secret place of the Most High God. See, God's not, God's not just some ogre that he was like a, just wanting to slap you around. No, he wants you to come back to the Father's house and live for him and honor him because he wants to bless you. He wants to favor you. He wants to shower goodness and mercy upon your life. That's why we dwell in the Father's house. Will you come back to the Father's house this morning? Will you come back to the Father's house? He's so good. He's so good. He's such a good Father. There, there's no sin that you've ever committed that God won't forgive you for. As a matter of fact, that, that the worst sin in your life was already forgiven 2,000 years ago on the cross. <laughs> Confess it. Repent, come back to the Father's house. Bow your heads, please, if you would. And I hope you were encouraged by this message because you can know that you know that you know that you're a child, a child of God. That you're part of the family of God. I don't want to live my life doubting my salvation. I don't want to live my life insecure. I want to know that I know. You know, church, we live in an insecure time. If anything, in 2020, you better know that you know that you know that you are a child of God. Don't live anymore with insecurity. Because God emptied heaven through his son to save you. He proved his worth. He demonstrated his love and that he sent Jesus to the cross. Will you receive him today? Right where you're at. The Bible says if you conf confess to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. The Bible says whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So how do you know that you're a child of God? What's step number one? It's receiving Jesus into your life, receiving him to your life. And it starts with the prayer. Just right where you're at, just pray this prayer and mean this. If you really want to receive Jesus, be born again into the family of God. Say, Jesus, I believe you died for me. It starts with a prayer. You got you to confess it before him, between you and God. Jesus, I, I believe you died for me on the cross. I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. Please save me. Please forgive me. And I thank you. I thank you for welcoming me into the family of God. Say, I make you the Lord of my life. You're my Savior. You, you might not even know all the, the pretty words to pray. Jesus, I just want to follow you. Jesus, I want to be saved. Jesus, I want to serve you. I want to honor you. And you mean that from your heart. You'll be saved. And for the rest of you, I just pray in Jesus' name that you would be secure in who you are. Because it does change everything. It changes everything. Your security makes you want to live for God. Your, your security makes you, oh, your, oh, it just feels good knowing that whatever happens in this old sinful world, I know that I've got heaven reserved for me. I'm not fearful of dying. I'm not fearful of catastrophe. Oh, I'm secure. 
And Father, I pray that in Jesus' name over every single person, whether it's a, a Christian that's listening, that they've been doubting their salvation. I pray a confirmation, Lord, a, a witness of the Spirit in their life, that they would be confirmed, as we saw in your word, that they are children of God. We don't base, we don't base our salvation off of feelings. We don't base our sonship off of whether we're having a good day or not. We base it upon the authority of the Word of God. Whether we feel it or not, yes. you said it in your Word. And we trust and we believe your Word because your Word said it will not return void. Pray that you would meet needs this morning, Father. And just, Lord, just ah, flood the church with your love with your grace, with your mercy. You love your children. You love your children. In the name of Jesus, we pray.